Hello, 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 everybody. Here we are back to our typical Wednesday lineup. We had um, a break these last couple of weeks from our usual Wednesday topic, which is the missing books of the Bible. That is because over on the Dark Outpost, we had negative 48 and some other guests on in the interim to discuss the Jesus strand, the bloodline of Christ, and how all that information goes hand in hand with what we are studying in these missing books of the Bible. So if you're new to the channel, welcome. I know I've jumped up subscribers over this last week, and I'm so, so grateful for you guys. So if this is your first time for a Wednesday video, I do the Wednesday videos a little bit different than the other days of the week. This is done in podcast form for the most part because we're going to be reading through these missing books of the Bible and so no need to see my face for that because literally I'm reading from the missing books of the Bible so it's something you can listen to while you're driving or cleaning your house or whatever it is that you do while you're listening to a podcast. Now again if you're new to the channel what I do on Wednesdays is a recap from what we do on Tuesdays over on the Dark Outpost with David Zublick. So on the Dark Outpost with David Zublick, that is a live show. So we go through this live from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Tuesday. Now David is not on YouTube. He used to be on YouTube, but he got flushed out about a year ago with a bunch of other people for basically, you know, sharing the truth. So now he is on his own platform, which is amazing because we don't have to worry about censorship or anything like that. We can openly discuss these books. A link to that platform is in the description box below if you want to join us. It is behind a paywall. I think it's only like $2 a month or something like that. It's super cheap and all of the money goes to basically upkeep of the platform. And I know he sends a percentage away every month to help children who are coming out of... um, really horrific situations. That's about all I can say. Basically what we're trying to fight right now is where that money goes is to help help with those kids. So again, super affordable. He's also on BitChute and Rumble. But again, his own platform is where we can talk openly. And again, because it's a live show, he typically has a number where you can call in if you want to contribute to the discussion. So that's a perk as well. But again, for those who are not on the Dark Outpost platform, I always do a recap on this show on my channel the day after we do the live show with David. Now with that being said, there are topics that I have to talk around on YouTube just because of the subject matter. So that is one of the benefits of going to David's platform is not only do you have David there as well to have a deeper conversation, it's not just me, but we also don't have to talk around stuff like we do on YouTube, which I'm sure most of you understand what I'm talking about with that. So again, a link for that is down in the description box below. So today we are going to be starting the Ascension of Isaiah, and I've literally just been in the trenches with this book. This book and the history behind it and the history behind Isaiah, I it's just super, super fascinating. And I'm a big nerd anyway. I like studying this stuff, so I find it very, very fascinating. You know, a lot of these biblical characters that we're already familiar with, again, as I've said many times, we kind of get grandfathered into their stories. And so sometimes the gravity of their stories and the reality of their stories kind of lose their effect on us, especially if you're like me, you were born in a Christian home. You just hear these over and over and over again. And so when you read these books that are missing from the Bible, it kind of brings a whole new perspective to stories you already knew. And so let's first start off, before we get into the history of the book, I want to talk a little bit about Isaiah. So who was Isaiah? Isaiah was an 8th century BC Israelite Israelite prophet and poet whose name means the Lord saves. He is considered one of the major prophets venerated by Christians, Muslims, and the Jewish faith. He is the one who most clearly explains Jesus. So again, he lived a long time before Jesus came, but he prophesied about Jesus coming and he 
oddly enough gives the clearest description in the Bible, in the canonized Bible, and I say oddly enough because most of the book of Isaiah is really hard to understand, which we're going to get into. So he prophesies that the salvation would come in the form of a man who would suffer atonement for the world. So as I said, even though this prophecy is clear, many of Isaiah's prophecies can be very confusing to read as he writes with the present, the near future, and the future future, it's all woven together like one train of thought. And it reminds me a lot, I'm a huge literature fan, and I've studied a lot of, of writers and literature um, and famous literary artists. And William Faulkner writes a bit like this, if you're familiar with William Faulkner. We spoke about him a bit last um, Wednesday in our Witch of Yazoo City video because he's an he's a southern writer he writes about um, the deep south but Faulkner writes the way we think so for example if you're reading one of his books like the unvanquished let's say you're you're you know seeing the story happen through the eyes of one of the characters but as the situation in the story is unfolding he's also writing about the sense memory or the memories triggered in the character as well so sometimes it gets a little bit confusing and that's kind of like the book of Isaiah too because everything Isaiah is seeing he's not putting it he's not organizing it and like okay this is what I'm prophesizing about now this is what I'm prophesizing about the near future and this is what I'm prophesizing about like 500 years from now no he doesn't say it that way he just puts it out there what he's seeing and so it can be overwhelming to read the book of Isaiah and again the book of Isaiah is in the canonized Bible it's one of our 66 books so we know that Isaiah was the son of Amoz although we don't know much about Amoz we know that Isaiah spent most of his life in Jerusalem in high positions of the royal court this tells us a few things this tells us that Isaiah was very well educated very wealthy and most likely aristocratic. Now in Isaiah 1-1 we see that Isaiah is basically needed by a lot of ruling kings. So in Isaiah 1-1 it says the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amoz saw during the reigns of Uzzah, Jothan, Azza, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So Isaiah is thought to be responsible for writing the book of Isaiah. However, as far back as the 1700s, many scholars believed he is only responsible for writing the first 39 chapters of the 66 chapters that are in the book of Isaiah. Many scholars believe that when they were editing the Bible in the 4th century, they compiled three works by three different prophets together to form the book of Isaiah. We know that chapter 39 in the book of Isaiah ends with the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. So I thought that was super interesting and we the 1700s for us living in 2021 was a long time ago. However, in the big scheme of history, that is modern times. And so we have a more educated a group of humans living on this planet and so a lot of people were reading through the book of Isaiah going, wait a minute, this does not seem like the same writer. And that's just interesting. If there are a couple other prophets that whose work got attributed to Isaiah for some reason. We know that with the editing of the Bible that um, a lot of things were changed for reasons that we might not know 100% until we're able to see the Vatican Library and see what the original text looked like. And I'll say this again, I've said this on the Dark Outpost, people will often write to me or say, but the Bible's the Word of God, it has to be true. The Bible's the Word of God, it has to be true. Yes, the Bible is the Word of God. However, what we have is not the Bible. The Bible you have in your house, the 66 canonized books that are in that book, are not the legitimate Bible. The legitimate Bible is hidden under the Vatican. None of us have seen the legitimate Bible. And we're getting more clarity as some of these missing books start to appear in our excavations. Because once again, a lot of these missing books, the Vatican has not released to us. We just have found them through excavations. And so we're trying to figure out what we're missing, what the truth is through these missing books of the Bible. But with that being said, as stressful as that might be to people, as freaky as that might be to people to know that they've been reading a book that's been altered for nefarious purposes, just know that God hasn't changed. God is still God. 
and we are living in the most incredible time to be alive where we're going to actually get to see the truth. And so don't, don't worry about it. It's all coming out. So I'm going to place a link down in the description box below for the book of Tobit that we just read, the part one, because in the book of Tobit, I did a deep dive into the political struggles at that time between Israel and Judah, which the same thing is happening here for Isaiah as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I'm not going to go into as much detail because I don't want to say the same thing over and over and over again for those of you who remember what was going on with the Assyrian conquest. Um, but if you missed that or you want to refresh, again, Again, that link will be down in the description box below so you could just listen to the first bit of that so you kind of have a deeper understanding historically of what was happening with the conquest of these states so Isaiah lived during the post golden age of Solomon when the two Jewish states were one nation so again remember under King David and his son Solomon the northern state of Israel and the kingdom of Judah became one nation. And then after Solomon, the nation split again with civil war, and it became Israel and the kingdom of Judah. During this time, pretty shady alliances were made with neighboring kingdoms. Again, we spoke about this in the book of Tobit, so you can link to that to hear a deeper uh, dive into that. But Israel to the north at this point, because we know that Isaiah is in Jerusalem, is the land of Judah, so the neighboring state of Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians, causing the ten tribes in the state to be exiled. So again, that was the book of Judah. So the same thing, we're in the same time period here. Isaiah was very vocal about the shady deals made by the rulers of Judah, especially Ahaz, whom we spoke about in the book of Tobit as well. He prophesied that there too would be a destruction of Judah and foreign exile and a restoration of Judah about a hundred years before it happened. Most of Isaiah's prophecies spoke of God's wrath and judgment mixed with God's message of hope and salvation, right? So he talks about everything falling apart as far as like the rulers of Judah not being um, loyal to God, which we're going to talk about because that's super important. But then he also talks about Jesus coming. The, he calls it and he calls Jesus in the ascension of Isaiah the beloved, which we're going to get to. But he talks about that as well. So even though it's kind of scary to read the book of Isaiah and to understand what was happening it's also interesting because within that struggle there's a light at the end of the tunnel that of course is Jesus so we know that Isaiah began his ministry at the death of Uzziah which was in 740 BC we know that Isaiah had a wife he considered to be a prophet as well. This is referenced in Isaiah 8 chapter 3 and that says, Then I made love to the prophet S, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Now, no records exist about his wife, but we do know from that one verse that she probably was as powerful as he was, which we've talked about a lot with the Jesus Strand with Negative 48, Sabrina Gal in Toronto about how we have this Mary Magdalene, we have this Order of the Blue Rose, we have the bloodline, which obviously there has to be a wife involved if there's a bloodline. And we just kind of see the same thing happening here where they had to like take away the power of the woman. And if you guys remember from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve or its original name, the Gospel of the Nazarenes, Jesus refers to God as Father Mother. He refers to God as both an energy of mother and father, like the ultimate parent. And so he is recognizing that there's a duality here, that there's a feminine and a masculine. That's why Jesus also anointed a lot of women to be apostles and disciples that, again, the church got rid of. So, um, so there you go. Even in the Old Testament, they were getting rid of these, these powerful, powerful women. Now, I found, I found this kind of funny. Um, Isaiah named two of his sons after his own prophecies. And I don't know if I'm saying this right, so please forgive me if I say this wrong. But the one son was Mahir, Shalil, Has, Baz, which means haste, spoil, seed, and pray. Pray as in P-R-E-Y, not A-Y. And another son was Shair, Jashub, which means remnant return. And I put in my notes here, what a freaking hippie. Like, I laughed when I saw that. Like, what a hippie. Here he is naming his sons after his own prophecies. I just giggled when I saw that. Anyway, he also had a daughter named Hephzibab. 
And Hephzibah would go on to marry the good king of Judah, Hezekiah. So Hezekiah, out of all the kings, were, was probably the best one where he tried to steer the people of Judah back into God's graces, which we're going to see some of Hezekiah in the ascension of Isaiah. So Hephzibah, Isaiah's daughter, marries Hezekiah, and she gives birth to to a king, Manasseh. He becomes king after his father, Hezekiah. Now, Manasseh was the 14th king of Judah. He became king at the age of 12. He ruled Judah for 55 years. This is the longest reign in Judah's history. He's the first king of Judah with no contemporary to the north because of the Assyrian invasion and the exile of the ten tribes of Israel. And something interesting, too, about the kingdom of Judah versus the state of Israel north is that the kingdom of Judah had a literal lineage, a literal bloodline of royalty from King David to Solomon, so forth and so forth and so forth. Whereas Israel was it was kind of a hodgepodge of people just like taking over and being on the throne and we talked about that a little bit again with the book of Tobit that there was no real line there but here here he is he is on the throne as the lineage and he kind of becomes Judah's worst nightmare okay so he brought back the worship of Baal that his father Hezekiah had gotten rid of and he was known to uh, give his kids to Moloch. That's all I'm going to say about that because of censorship. Y'all know what I mean by give his kids. So we see this in 2 Kings 21. That's the chapter in the canonized Bible where you can go back if you want to read for yourself. In the canonized Bible, that's where that is. And it, we also have reference to Manasseh being pretty evil in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15, 4. He kind of talks about like the desecration of Judah is going to come because of Manasseh being like super, super evil. So Manasseh has Isaiah, his own grandfather, removed from the earth plane. If you know what I'm talking about, I'm going to use Janine's words there because I can't say the actual word on on YouTube for speaking out about his religious policies and it's pretty graphic the way he has Isaiah leave the earth plane um, he's basically cut into two pieces and we see this in Hebrew 1137 they were put to death by stoning and they were sewed in two they were killed by the sword they went about in sheepskins and goatskins destitute persecuted and mistreated so um, that's that now, a fun fact for you guys, Isaiah 2-4 is on the wall at the United Nations in New York, and it says, They shall beat their swords into the plowshares and their spears into running hooks. Nations shall not lift up swords against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. In the book of Isaiah, I believe he's talking about the thousand years of peace that we're coming into because there is that apocalyptic uh, vision that Isaiah has. Um, but of course, it's interesting that the United Nation uses that because we know the United Nation absolutely does not want the thousand years of peace. They want, you know, another way of life. Let's just put it that way. All right, so let's talk about the ascension of Isaiah. So now that we have kind of a background on who Isaiah is as a person that lived so many historians have no clue when this book was written. So most of the books that we've gone through, we have at least some idea from historians about when this book was actually written. But this book, they literally have no clue. Um, they want to believe that it was written between the 1st and 3rd century, but there's no basis for this. There's literally no clues to date this work. I personally believe that it existed during the times of Isaiah. The books still exist in the Ethiopian church, which again, Ethiopia for the win. Ethiopia, you guys seem to keep all these books and that's, you know, virtual high five to you guys because y'all basically like turned your back to the Canaanites and were like, no, we're keeping these books. And so the only surviving, the oldest copy we have of the Ascension of Isaiah that's surviving, the oldest one, is comes from the, either the 5th to 7th century AD. So that's pretty new compared to like the Old Testament writings. We know that there are fragments of this book that exist in Greek, Coptic, Latin, and Old Slavic. And there are possibly some fragments left in Hebrew and Aramaic. So 
literally given the full copy, the oldest copy we have is from the fifth century, but we know because Paul talks about the ascension of Isaiah in his letters. Peter talks about the, we know that the disciples even mention this book, like it's fair game, like it's a part of their studies. So that's why I believe that it was written in the Old Testament times during the time of Isaiah because they knew about it. And if the old, oldest copy we have is in the fifth century, there's no way that we can possibly know when the first ever copy was created for the ascension of Isaiah. And so that's why a lot of historians just kind of put their hands up and they're like, we, we just have no way of knowing. Um, until Again, until we can get to that Vatican library, we got no way of knowing. So many biblical scholars who are like us that that really want to look at these um, these old books believe that this is a legit book because of Second Chronicles thirty two thirty two, and that says the other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah son of Amos in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So in Second Chronicles they're saying, hey, this is all written down in another book. It's kind of like me saying to you guys, like, I'm not going to go into the deep dive on this episode of the history of the Assyrian conquest because it's in the other video, right? That's kind of what they're saying here in Second Chronicles. Like, we're not going to write all this down because you can just go read the Ascension of Isaiah to get the details. So that's why these biblical scholars are like, okay, this gives us a clue that they had this book, that this book was a part of their, their religious library. So we're going to see in this book that there are topics covered such as the Antichrist, like Abraham and the apocalypse of Abraham that we covered. Isaiah will leave his body and ascend into heaven where he will see the future. Isaiah will also meet Jesus in his heavenly form in the seventh heaven, which again was spoken about in the apocalypse of Abraham. He describes him as the archangel of all archangels. This book also can be grouped in three different sections. That's the Testament of Hezekiah, the Vision of Isaiah, and the Martyrdom of Isaiah. So with that being said, let's break into the book. So we're going to start with chapter 1 here. And it came to pass in the 26th year of the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, that he called Manasseh his son. Now he was his only one. And he called him into the presence of Isaiah, the son of Amos, the prophet, and into the presence of Josab, the son of Isaiah, in order to deliver unto him the words of righteousness, which the king himself had seen. And of the eternal judgments and tortures of Gehenna, so Gehenna is considered to be a holding cell in the afterlife where evildoers go to atone for their sins. So remember, again, this was before Jesus. So this was in Jew. I know it sounds like purgatory, like the Catholic Church purgatory, but this was in a Jewish culture that this Gehenna was a place, again, where evildoers would go to atone for their sins for a time being before they could enter into the paradise because this was before Jesus. So. Let's read that again, verse 3. And the eternal judgments and torments of Jehanna and of the prince of this world and of his angels and his authorities and his powers. So during this book, we will see a lot of references to the prince of this world and to the god of this world. Please note that this is referring to Lucifer, whom we know has many names. Please remember that God allowed Lucifer to rule the earth for a certain amount of time, and at the end of his time, aka the apocalypse, God would be restored. When you see the American dollar bill that says, in God we trust, now ask yourself which God the Federal Reserve is referring to. This is why the dark cult has been able to get so powerful. This is why they are falling so hard right now because their time is up. So I really, really want people to understand that. And I think a lot of Christians, especially evangelical Christians, have a hard time getting this in their heads. And, in, and this is why, in my opinion, the Gnostic Christians were so heavily smeared because the Gnostic Christians, the original Christians, understood this. And it's not even something that we really need to like, quote unquote, understand with critical thinking skills because God says this over and over in the canonized Bible as well as in the missing text. It's there. This is not just an opinion. It's there in the text. When man fell from grace, when man ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and suffered those consequences, regardless of whether you think that's an actual story or a metaphor from something that happened, at that point, 
Lucifer gained power and God made a deal with Lucifer. This was very much written out in the book of Jubilees that Lucifer would be able to rule this planet, this earth, whatever you think that we're, we're on, whatever that is, for a certain amount of time. He told this to Abraham too in the apocalypse of Abraham, that God would back off and let Lucifer do his thing. The reason why God did this is because man has to suffer those consequences of understanding good and evil. We cannot fully understand good until we fully understand evil. We cannot understand the light until we fully understand the dark. And when we fully understand both, then we are able to make a free will decision of who we want to serve. And that is why the Gnostics followed an uh, idea that's very uh, common in yoga, that's the idea of yoga, that they are not of this world, that the natural world we live in is nothing but an illusion, the matrix, and that your spirit is not a part of this because they understood that this world was ruled by Lucifer. And again, this is why, this is why our elite, why the governments, like deep state, like all those, the deep church, they've all been able to get away with this crap and get so powerful because Lucifer was the God of this earth. I hope that makes sense. And now as we come into the apocalypse, the end of time, again, that's not the end of our time. It's not the end for us. It's not the tribulation for us. It's the end of their time. It's the end of Satan's time. It's their tribulation. Okay, so that's what he's saying here is that, again, once again, the God of Earth is Lucifer. At this point, for us, we're very lucky to be here where it's now shifting and God's coming in and wiping Lucifer clear off the map. His time's up. All right, so this brings us to chapter four and the words of the faith of the beloved. So when we see the word beloved in the ascension of Isaiah, it's capitalized. This is referring to the coming of Jesus. So this is what he's calling Jesus. Because again, he saw Jesus. He met Jesus in his spirit form. He doesn't know him on the earth because Jesus has still got a few years before he'll actually be on the earth. So in the words of the beloved, which he himself had seen in the 15th year of his reign during his illness. So this is referring to Hezekiah. So in 2 Kings 21, they speak of Hezekiah's illness. And he delivered un unto him the written words which... Simnas the scribe had written, and also which Isaiah the son of Amoz had given to him, and also to the prophets that they might write and store up with him that he himself had seen in the king's house regarding the judgment of the angels, angels lowercase a, and destruction of this world, and regarding the garments of the saints, and their going forth, and the regarding of their transformation, and the persecution and the ascension of the beloved again Jesus so he's seeing the coming of Jesus the fall and the destruction of the world all that kind of stuff in the 20th year of the reign of Hezekiah Isaiah had seen the words of this prophecy and had delivered them to Josab his son and whilst he Hezekiah gave commands Josab the son of Isaiah standing by Isaiah said to Hezekiah the king, but not in the presence of Manasseh, only did he say unto him, As the Lord liveth, and the spirit which speaketh in me liveth, all these commands and all these words will be made of none effect by Manasseh thy son, and through the agency of his hands I shall depart mid the torture of my body. So he's telling Hezekiah that his son Manasseh is going to basically force Isaiah off the earth plane again in that word, the E word that I can't use on YouTube. And Semiel, which is another word for Satan, will serve Manasseh and execute all his desires and he will become a follower of Belier. So Belier is another word for Lucifer. So Satan, Lucifer, we're going to see lots of names for them in this book rather than of me. So he's saying Manasseh is going to return back to these basically satanic faith that we know is recorded also in the canonized Bible. And many in Jerusalem and in Judea, he will cause to abandon the true faith, and Balier will dwell in Manasseh, so the devil will dwell of Manasseh, and by his hands shone asunder. And when Hezekiah heard these words, he wept very bitterly, and rent his garments, and placed earth upon his head, and fell on his face. And 
Isaiah said unto him, The counsel of Samael, or Satan, against Manasseh is consumed, not will avail thee. So basically he's telling Hezekiah, as Hezekiah is getting upset, that nothing's going to change this. This is the plan. This, this is what's going to have to happen. Like nothing you can do can change this. And on that day, Hezekiah resolved in his heart to slay Manasseh, his son. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, the beloved hath made of none effect thy, thy design, and the purpose of thy heart will not be accomplished. For with this calling have I been called, and I shall inherit the heritage of the beloved. So he's saying, do not get rid of your son. We have to let this, we have to allow this to play out. So this brings us to chapter two. We're just going to read chapter one and chapter two today. So this will be the last chapter we cover today before next week. And it came to pass after that Hezekiah died and Manasseh became king, that he did not remember the commands of Hezekiah, his father, but forgot them. And Semael, Satan, abode in Manasseh and clung fast to him. And Manasseh forsook the service of God of his father, and he served Satan and his angels and his powers. So he's serving Satan. And he turned aside the house of his father, which had been before the face of Hezekiah, from the words of wisdom and from the service of God. Because again, remember, Hezekiah's father, so Manasseh's other grandfather, had basically turned Judah back into like more of a satanic place. And then Hezekiah turned it back to God, and now Manasseh is turning it back to Satan. So this brings us to chapter four, or verse 4 of chapter 2. And Manasseh turned aside his heart to serve Belier for the angel of lawlessness, who is the ruler of this world. So again, there it is, guys. Belier for the angel of lawlessness, who is the ruler of this world. So they're telling us again, Lucifer is the ruler of this world. God is not our God. The God of light is not the ruler of this world right now. He stepped aside to allow Lucifer to do, do his thing. And now at the end of time in the apocalypse, when the time switches, that's when God's going to come in and just push Lucifer off, send him back down to hell and take over again and that's when goodness will be back will rule the earth again earth again he delighted in jerusalem because of manasseh and he made him strong in apostatizing israel and the lawlessness which were spread abroad in jerusalem and witchcraft and magic increased and divination inauguration and fornication and adultery in the presence of righteousness by manasseh and to tobiah the canaanite and john of anathoth and by zodok the chief of the work and the rest of the Acts, behold, they are written in the book of Kings and Judah and of Israel. So that's 2 Kings 21, 1 through 8. So once again, we're seeing this book go, okay, so the rest of the stuff he did, it's already written down in the, in, in, uh, the book of Kings and the Judah of Israel. So go back and read there. Like I said, Second Chronicles did that with the Ascension of Isaiah. They're saying just reference back to other books so you don't we don't have to repeat the story over and over again. And when Isaiah the son of Amoz saw the lawlessness which was being perpetrated in Jerusalem and the worship of Satan and his wantonness, he withdrew from Jerusalem and settled in Bethlehem of Judah. And also there was much lawlessness and withdrawing from Bethlehem. He settled on a mountain in a desert place. And Micaiah the prophet and the aged Ananias and Joel and Habakkuk and his son Jasab and many of the faithful who believed in the ascension into heaven withdrew and settled on the mountain. So they basically exiled themselves. They went into hiding because they don't want to have to participate in Manasseh's little dark cult, right? This religion of Lucifer. So they just backed away and went into the mountains and kind of hid. They were all clothed with garments of hair and they were all prophets and they had nothing with them but were naked and they all laminated with great laminations because of the going astray of Israel. And these eat nothing save wild herbs, which they gathered on the mountains. And having cooked them, they lived thereon together with Isaiah the prophet. And they spent two years of days on the mountains and the hills. So they were living in hiding, basically living like they were in an ashram, like eating vegan, basically, for two years, focusing on God. And after this, whilst they were in the desert, there was a certain man in Samaria named Belchiria in the family of Zedekiah, the son of Chenan, a false prophet, whose dwelling was in Bethlehem. Now Hezekiah, the son of Chenai, who was the brother of his father, and in the days of Ahab, king of Israel, had been a teacher of the 400 prophets of Baal, and himself smitten and reproved 
Micaiah, the son of Ammon, the prophet. And he, Micaiah, had been reproved by Ahab and cast into a prison. So Micaiah is another prophet that we read about in the Bible. They all kind of were around the same time. And he was with Zedekiah, the prophet. They were with Isaiah, the son of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And Elijah, the prophet of Tabon of Gilead, was reproving Ahaziah and Samaria and prophesied regarding Ahaziah that he should die on his bed of sickness and that Samaria should be into the hand of Liba Nassar because he had slain the prophets of God. And when the false prophets who were with Ahaziah the son of Ahab and their teachers Jalargias of Mount Joel had heard. Now he was the brother of Zedekiah and they were they persuaded Ahaziah the king of Agron and slew Micaiah. So there are some bad people in their midst, basically. And we know, again, Micaiah and Zedekiah from the Bible and their stories as well. So basically, there's just trouble a-brewing. So that brings us to Chapter 3, which we're going to pause at Chapter 3 and pick up with Chapter 3 next week. So once again, thank you guys so much for being here today. Please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. I hope you're having a fantastic week. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And thank you for Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. I will talk to you all soon. Bye.